good morning. Would you stand and let's worship together? Oh, Lord, my God, when I, an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds I hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, I power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! And sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think, and when I think, God, His Son, not sparing, sent Him to die. I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away. Sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And sing my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great. Thou art, how great Thou art. Sing, when Christ, when Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my
The scripture reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 through 20. The resurrection of the dead. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we are past those who would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can be true if there's no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I will worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before, let me be seen when the Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I will worship Your holy name. His soul. 
I sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship your holy. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I will worship your holy name. I will worship your holy name. I will worship your holy name. In Christ alone, my hope is found. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter.
ourselves. Amen. You may be seated. May you lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the life we have in your Son, Jesus Christ. Spiritual life. We thank you for the physical life we have, the bodies that you've given to us. And we offer them back to you today with our voices, with our songs, the energy, the, the thought, the direction of our bodies towards you, living sacrifices. We present ourselves this, this morning to you. We ask that your spirit would be at work as we hear your word proclaimed, that we would have ears to hear, hearts to understand and respond to what you're speaking to us today. So we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, welcome, everyone, this fine morning. We have a few announcements, and I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, the first announcement we'd have is this Saturday, November 6th, is the Mission Fellowship. Starting at 5.30, uh, you could come and enjoy dinner with uh, the professionals in residence. So if you haven't met them yet, we have several, uh, well, two different professionals in residence this semester. And this is the opportunity to meet with them, to talk about missions, to uh, hear uh, some global perspectives, to ask questions. Uh, so you need the RSVP, but it's fairly simple. Email kimschool at gs.edu. So this Saturday at 5.30. So our speaker today, uh, alumni, two-time alumni of Gateway Seminary, with both an MDiv and a PhD, Dr. Andrew Marquez. Uh, he has, uh, wears a lot of hats. And so as I was looking through his bio here, uh, he leads the Arizona campuses for Wayland Baptist University. He's the, their executive director and campus dean. He also serves as an assistant professor of biblical studies for Wayland Baptist University, and he pastors North Swan Baptist Church in Tucson, Arizona. A few other interesting things. He has a pod podcast, Baptist on the Bible. So if you're interested uh, in uh, an interesting podcast for the commute, I would encourage you to look at that. Um, and then we gave him today, you know, one of the easiest passages, I thought. You know, we've got this series, difficult passages, and we thought, you know, is it alumni? We should go easy on them. Let's can you take this one, right? And, uh, so very uh, happy to welcome uh, Dr. Andrew Marquez to share from Scripture with us today. Thank you. All right, just getting my things here. If you'll turn in your Bibles or whatever device you have a Bible on to 1 Corinthians 15, that would be good. I'll do the same here. And while you're turning there, I'd just like to express my gratitude uh, to Gateway Seminary and to Dr. Zorge and Dr. Groza for uh, inviting me to speak on this topic and expressing some sense of confidence that I could handle it. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but uh, I remember really fond memories of coming to chapel as a student. I tried not to miss a chapel uh, while I was here. And, you know, it was just so refreshing uh, to worship with my peers. You know, it's hard work studying and preparing for ministry. And many of you are already in ministry even now. And so it's just so refreshing to worship together. Uh, it is humbling to be on this side of the podium at a chapel service, but I hope that this will be a blessing for you and for me as we engage the Scripture together. Since we have been looking at difficult passages this fall, I wanted to have some uh, hermeneutical words to you, if that's a thing, uh, interpretive rules that we're looking at. I wanted to uh, let you know that uh, I'm trying to address this topic, but in such a way that you can see the use of different interpretive methods as we go. They won't necessarily be uh, pointed out along the way, but one of the things I wanted to direct you to is it's called the hermeneutical triad. The hermeneutical triad has been proposed by Kostenberger and Patterson in their uh, great work, The Invitation to Biblical Interpretation. Uh, the triad consists of looking at the scripture through the lenses of literature and theology and history. And so that's what we will be doing today. The hope is to let the meaning of the text ring in the chord of its various contexts. I'll be focused primarily from the view of the literature and the literary aspects of this text, but I will consult history and theology as it's helpful. Ha! Huh. The title of this message is Baptism for 
or the resurrection of the dead. Prioritizing Paul's purpose in 1 Corinthians 15, 29 through 34. I don't want this to just be an academic discussion, but I may have loaded up too much, so I will be moving very briskly through this uh, message today. But I'm hoping that you will be encouraged spiritually as we look at this very important text together. There are three ways I want to encourage you. One is I want to embolden you to engage difficult texts on your own so that as you're looking at other passages of Scripture, that you will have confidence that God's Word is true and it is integral. It holds together. Second, I hope that you will evaluate your own life's actions today for evidence that you believe in the resurrection. Do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? Third, I want you to examine the influences that you're bringing into your life with an eye to cutting off any that might be subversive to a commitment to sound doctrine or godly living. Let's go ahead and read the passage together, beginning at verse 29 of Chapter 15, it says, Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead if the dead are not raised at all? Why then are they baptized for them? Why are we in danger every hour? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Amen, and may God bless the reading of his word. The discussion now will divide into three pieces. The first is going to be looking at a practice that points to the resurrection of the dead. Next, we are going to be looking at perseverance, even through persecution, that proves our own belief in the resurrection of the dead. And finally, we're going to be observing pursuits, the pursuits in our lives. Do they proceed from a foundation in the truth of the resurrection of the dead? So let's get at it. A practice that points to the resurrection. We just read this verse. It begins with a word that is connecting to something that came before, otherwise. And then Paul moves into two questions that we'll look at. What are they doing, those that baptize for the dead, and why do they do it? So we're going to address those questions and then go forward from there. But the otherwise is important because when we look at this word otherwise, we have to say, well, otherwise to what? What is Paul referring to? And we read in our responsive reading this morning that he is going to chapter 15, verse 20, to refer to the positive statement that now Christ has been raised from the dead as the first fruits of those who are asleep. That is the foundational statement. Christ is raised as a first fruits of the resurrection. The, re- the resurrection has already been demonstrated in Christ, and it is coming for you and I. This is something that is reverberated throughout the chapter, which is focused on the resurrection of the dead. We go back to verse 12. It says, If Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how are some among you saying there is no resurrection for the dead? In fact, if we go all the way back to verse 3, we'll see that there is a a theme that is set up. This might even be a baptismal catechism that he's reading. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture. The whole chapter is about the resurrection of the dead, that this is a necessity of a Christian belief, that everything else we do falls apart. The reading that we read earlier in verses 12, going on to verse 19, reflect what would happen to our theology, what are the ramifications of a Christian life with no resurrection. Our preaching is in vain. Our sins still hold us. There is no freedom. We are lost without the resurrection of the dead. The verses we're looking at now are going to focus on the practical, the practical realities of what it means to have a resurrection or the horrible realities of not having a resurrection for the dead. And so we are going to now dive into that first question. What are they doing? What will those do who are baptized for the dead? Now, I will argue that the word what captures our attention, but it's less important than the why. The what is something that brought me here today. This is what makes the difficult passage difficult, right? It's what captures our curiosity. In fact, we find that this is such a difficult 
passage to navigate that Konzelman, in 1975, said there's 200 different interpretations of this passage. I've decided not to devote one minute to each interpretation, lest we get out in three and a half hours. We'll have to be brief. (laughs) I'm going to approach three different solutions here. But the important thing is, while we're interested in this passage, it may not give us what we want. We need to address it anyway, though, because there are not only important academic questions that we want to find out, there's also some significant pastoral questions. If they're baptizing for the dead in Corinth, what's it for? What is it, and what are they they accomplishing? Some of the questions that I was thinking in reading through this was, uh, is there an ordinance of the church that we lost? Is, Is there an extra baptism we're not aware of? Is there something missing in the way we're doing baptism today? Is there something more than just a symbol within a baptism? Is there a regeneration there? If if people are baptizing vicariously for the dead, does it mean that there's a regenerative work they're hoping that will take place in some kind of post-mortem sense? Kind of a more personal question, what happens to a Christian brother or sister who dies unbaptized? And the most pointed, can my lost, departed family member still be saved? Is there something that I could do to make that a reality? These are real questions that were being wrestled with with the Corinthians in that first century, and the apostles are addressing it. But this practice, unfortunately, it's so brief that that our minds wander, and we try to uh, make assumptions and try to get, get a hold of this. But the reality is the desire to answer these questions drives the interest, but I think that we too often are drawing more out of this verse than is there. And we have to be content with what it actually gives us. So let's go ahead and look at some options that we're working with here. There are some textual issues that are going to drive the options. First off, what is meant by baptism here? Baptism appears in the middle, passive, baptizo menoi, baptizantai. This may be Christian initiation, or it might be utilizing the word baptism to refer to some kind of ritual purification, a washing. We know in the Septuagint, if you go to the Old Testament, Naaman in 2 Kings 5 is told to go to the Jordan and wash yourself to cure the leprosy. The word baptism is used there. Uh, We we also know if we got into the the apocryphal literature that Judith goes and washes herself nightly, and that word used is baptism. We also see that in uh, Sirach, there is a proverb that is told about why touch a corpse after you've been baptized. You'll just have to be purified yet again. And so the idea here is washing for purification. There's a chance that that's all that this is referring to, but it could also be Christian initiation baptism, which is what we normally think of when we see the word baptism in the New Testament. The next question is, what does hooper mean? All right, the word for. Is this for the sake of, all right, on behalf of, or on account of? It can mean different things depending on the context, and that will drive a different interpretation. Thirdly, we have the word the dead with the article, kind of in a stylized form. Does this mean literal dead? Could it mean figurative dead? Is this a partitive group? Some of the dead among the dead, right? Uh, We have to work through all these, and just mixing and matching those different interpretive possibilities is driving numerous interpretations before your eyes. So the first option we'll go through now is the most challenging theologically, and yet seems to be maybe the most straightforward in the reading. Option one, vicarious ritual of certain Corinthians that is performed on behalf of departed loved ones to the benefit of the deceased. Is there a vicarious baptism for the dead that was going on at Corinth? Well, maybe. I solved it for you there. I can go home. If that was what is going on, uh, who would be doing such a thing? Uh, the, The thoughts that have been proposed are that we have Gentile seekers We know that unbelievers actually participated in the Corinthian worship service from Corinthians, the the letter we have before us, but more likely Greek converts to Christianity that are bringing in with them some practices from the mystery religions. You know, it's been proposed that there's the Orphic uh, consecrations or the Februarian lustrations that these vicarious activities were then attached to Christian baptism to do a good act on behalf of the dead. The issue is that the Greeks often didn't believe in a physical resurrection of the dead, as we've seen at Mars Hill. When Paul got to the issue of resurrection for the dead, he lost most of his audience, although he had a few that stuck around. This would fit as a good opposition to Paul. He's trying to say the resurrection matters, and there would be a group that's practicing a practice that points to the resurrection while denying the resurrection, and so maybe that's what's going on here. 
We know that over time, there are heterodox Christian groups that are developing vicarious practices for the dead. We see in the Shepherd of Hermas that there are stones coming up from the deep and that these stones, we're told, are getting the seal of baptism from the apostles post-mortem because they weren't able to be baptized in their lives. We know that by the Pista Sophia, 4th century perhaps, that there is a vicarious mysteries performed to bring people into Gnosis, the knowledge. Tertullian and Chrysostom tell us that the Marcionite Gnostics were baptizing the dead. In fact, we're told by Chrysostom exactly what happened. When a catechumen departs among them, having concealed the living man under the couch of the dead, they approach the corpse and talk with him and ask him if he wishes to receive baptism. Then, when he makes no answer, he that is concealed underneath saith in his stead that, of course, he should wish to be baptized. And so they baptize him instead of the departed, like men jesting on a stage. Now, this is one group condemning another group. We don't know what the Marcionites were doing in their own words, but we see that by the fourth century, there are Christian groups baptizing for the dead. And we know today, I'm from Arizona, there's a lot of LDS communities, Mormon country, Baptizing for the dead is a practice going on even to this day. The question is, is that what was going on at Corinth? Perhaps. And if it is what's going on at Corinth, the question that we must be careful not to to draw a yes to is, is Paul saying we should be doing this practice? Notice that he's got a third person. Those doing that thing, why do they do it and what do they do it for? What is it? He's not saying we do this, but rather he's speaking of a group that is doing a practice that points to the resurrection. There is no approval. In fact, the uh, view of many is that this is an ad hominem attack on his opponents and would have been understood as something Paul condemned, though Paul doesn't condemn it. And by not condemning it, one interpreter says, has he opened Pandora's box of a mess on our hands because he didn't take time to condemn it? The same apostle who spent half a chapter on dress code, right? How could he fail to condemn it? Well, he might have to condemn it. <laughs> it doesn't mean that he's approving it. But is there any input maybe that we would gain from theology to suggest that there's nothing wrong with our current ordinances? You know, we, we don't have a slam dunk case against any practice like this, but what we do see is passages like 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we have Hebrews 9.27, is appointed man once to die, and then the judgment. It does not seem that the Bible lays out a whole case of post-mortem conversion, and never anywhere do we find a way of my baptism on behalf of someone who's died making some sort of advantage for them. And so we can't draw more than what we have. Let's go to another option. This is the influenced or honorary baptism. The interpretation here looks at baptism as Christian uh, initiation, that they are actually being baptized for the Christians uh, in, in the, into the Christian uh, life, but they're doing it on account of the dead rather than on behalf of the dead. And so if that can be read in this light, what we see is that the dead is the fallen Corinthians, those that have de- deceased at Corinth. And that there were people that were going to church and were thinking about giving their lives to Christ. And when they watched a brother or sister hold to faith even in death, it's what brought them ultimately to salvation. And so they are being baptized on account of the testimony of the faithful witness. There are those that have even taken this one step further and said that it's not even just those that have died, but those that, like Paul says in verse 30, are dying daily. That the apostolic witness, the persecution that is endured, the hardship that is lived, a daily death that this is what is driving people to become followers of Christ and to be baptized on account of that witness. This is a good solution. Theologically, it fits very well. The difficulty here is Hooper is not as naturally read on account of in this context, and then uh, the word dead would be required to be both figurative if it's the apostles and literal within the same context. Now, if it's the dead Christians, then that uh, objection falls off. A third option would say that this is just standard Christian baptism. There's nothing special going on here at all. The interpretation would be, what do they do, those who are baptized, for the dead? And the dead there would indicate their own dead bodies. This interpretation is interesting because the word dead is highlighted in a way that that draws attention to it, but it also has the most historical precedent, right? And it's got some theological 
uh, justification as well. We know from Romans, right? Romans 6 verse 3 tells us, Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ has been raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. The idea of baptism being associated with a living death gives us understanding that Paul has used the words to symbolize that reality in other places. Now, this was the view of the fathers. Tertullian, in the second, third century, he is making the case that this is, in fact, what Paul meant, and that Paul tells us this further in the argument, because the very next section is going into the question, what body do they have, those that are resurrected? And so Tertullian says it's an ipso facto uh, proclamation of what Paul meant by the dead, that it's the body, that the bodies are being baptized because we realize they are dead bodies. We have been, uh, we're on a journey to death, right? Uh, our, our sins and trespasses have, have killed our bodies in a sense. The wages of sin is death. This is also the view of Chrysostom. And he argues that the words here, while they're terse for us, point back to an early uh, catechism that was recited by the catechumens awaiting baptism. And the idea was that they are saying, as they're being baptized, I do this for uh, the baptism for the dead, for the joy of the resurrection. My dad baptized in the same church for 31 years, and every time it was buried in the likeness of his death, raised to new life in the light of his resurrection. And so Chris Ostom says that what we see here is language that is well known to the Corinthian readers, that they're referring to what they say as they're being baptized, and that they would know that it is their dead bodies. So we have some insights there from history. Calvin actually makes this even a little bit more uh, cutting by suggesting that these are people who've delayed baptism and are now on their deathbeds. And so they're going to be baptized for their own dead bodies, but that reality is very real. It's, it's, it's soon. It's close. Problems with this view is, again, we have the figurative use of the word dead along with the literal view. So we, we have dead bodies that are not quite yet dead to proclaim a resurrection of truly dead bodies. And does that fit together? Um, it is a good verse. Uh, it's a good interpretation. Uh, one thing that I'd like to point to is that within this chapter, when Paul speaks of fallen Christians... He's using the idiom that they have fallen asleep. And he doesn't usually refer to them in that sense that they died. And so maybe he's giving us some clues as to what he's doing there, that he is using uh, the dead in a stylistic way in this verse. This is the option that I would choose if I had to choose an option. But at the end of the day, I stand with Simon Christemaker, who says, in spite of all the exegesis, a satisfactory solution appears to be elusive. Well, I could end the discussion there. But I won't. We'll keep going. What do we do when we don't have the solutions that we wanted? We didn't find out what we were hoping for. Well, I think the best part here is to go back to context, which is king. I heard that in a different uh, discussion at one of these chapels. But we, we have to look at what the argument is. It's not about the what. It is about the why. Why are they doing what they do if there's no baptism for the dead? What Paul's saying is if these are my opponents who don't uh, believe in the resurrection... They have a practice that reveals a hope in the resurrection. It's as though there are no atheists in foxholes. At the end of the day, you do what we do because we hope in the same thing, that there really is a resurrection of the dead. If these are Christians that are being converted and baptized in the moment, these are catechumens awaiting baptism, Paul's saying at the start of our journey into faith, we believe in the resurrection. And then he'll move on to his own discussion. Those of us that are being persecuted for the faith, we do it because we believe in the resurrection. It's important to recognize there is no scriptural basis elsewhere for vicarious baptism of the dead. There is no practice we need to emulate or create. No direct approval is given in this verse, and we are not even sure if this verse speaks of vicarious baptism from the dead. So what should we do in light of this? We need to recognize that we have practices in worship. And our practices in worship should mean something, right? Do our practices point to the resurrection of the dead? Do we have worship practices that reflect the belief? When we baptize today, do we point to the resurrection of the dead? When we sing, do we sing, as we did this morning, right, to the risen Savior? He is in my heart today. When we share the Lord's table, do we proclaim the death of Christ and subsequently the resurrection that has taken place because he is coming again? 
We need to make sure that our worship practices are meaningful and are undergirding true doctrine. My childhood pastor, Herb Franks, used to love the saying that if I ever lost my voice, I will find the busiest corner in town and I will just point up. And I love it. But he understood that we need to direct people to the truth of the gospel and our worship practices should do that. All right? So those are the muddled through questions and now I'm going to briskly move through the next section of the passage and hopefully we'll get there before lunch. We have a practice that points to the resurrection, but Paul is not content to leave it there. He says, now we are moving to a perseverance that proves that the resurrection is real. He is going to shift his pronouns. They are doing what they're doing, and now we are doing what we are doing, and I am doing what I am doing because we believe in the resurrection of the dead. Verse 30 says, why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do we have a perseverance, even to the point of persecution, that proves that what we believe is really what we believe, what we pronounce is true? Paul points to the hardship that's being undergone even by the Corinthian leaders and be but by himself. He actually envelops an oath that he takes on behalf of the Corinthians here, saying that we are suffering, but we do it for a reason. If there's no resurrection for the dead, why do we suffer daily? Why are we in constant danger? And then I personally fought with the wild beast at Ephesus. And then we're saying, well, there's another difficult passage. I don't remember Paul being thrown to the animals. Do you? And so we don't have time to to mess with this one too much, but generally in my mind, I think he is talking about a stylized form of persecution. And in general, I think it actually has connections to the demonic opposition that he has faced. If you remember when Jesus went out to be tempted, he went into the wilderness where the devil tempted him and the wild animals were present. And so the Jewish apocalyptic often envisioned persecution, demonic spiritual opposition through wild animals. So Paul is saying, literal or not, I am in big trouble, constantly in danger, going against hardship, And why would I do that? What gain is there to be had if there is no resurrection from the dead? And then he says, I boast in the Lord on you. It's such a strange phrasing here, but I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus, I die daily. I go through this. I suffer these things because I believe in a resurrection from the dead and a reward to be had. And you are my reward. You can hear Thessalonians ringing through in that great verse. I'll get there. 1 Thessalonians 2.19, you are our hope, our joy, our crown in the presence of Jesus when he comes. Why do these? What's the gain if there's no resurrection? But there is. If there was no resurrection, why not just enjoy the limited time that we have? Let's eat and drink. Tomorrow we die. But if there is a resurrection, we should live for the future. Paul makes a quote here of Isaiah 22. And there is a danger coming on Jerusalem. And instead, actually, I do want to read it. Let's go ahead and read it. I was going to skip, but it's too exciting. Danger at the gates. Jerusalem, what should they do? Therefore, in that day, the Lord God of hosts called you to weeping, to wailing, to shaving the head, and to wearing sackcloth. Instead, there is gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we may die. But the Lord of hosts revealed himself to me. Surely this iniquity shall not be forgiven you until you die, says the Lord God of hosts. If there's a resurrection of the dead, there's a judgment, and God is active in history. And instead of making every moment of the present as good as possible, we need to endure hardship and pain and suffering because there is a resurrection, there is a judgment, and there is a reward. Don't be like these people. Even today, are we persevering in our own understanding of a resurrection that's coming? Do we believe in a judgment? Have we persevered over the last year? It's been difficult in America over the last year. And are you persevering perhaps in love for the brothers and sisters? In the midst of mandates, in the midst of masks and meetings, is virtual church a new thing? Is it temporary? Have you loved your brothers and sisters? Now, I say this out loud, and it almost makes me ashamed to say that we're enduring persecution. Because we have brothers and sisters throughout the world that are enduring 
real persecution, martyrdom, torture, and death. What are we doing for them? Are we praying for them? You'll pray better if you know what's going on. There's a meeting on Saturday. Maybe you can learn from some of the visiting missionaries. Maybe you can investigate the IMB website and learn what our missionaries are doing. Perhaps you could adopt a region and commit to praying for that region. Maybe Lottie Moon Christmas offering. There's a sacrificial gift you could give to support our missionaries. Do we believe in the resurrection? Do the investments matter? Are you bearing witness to Christ in the same way that Paul was bearing witness? Remember, he said that I am going to have you as my reward. This verse in Thessalonians I quoted is the soul winner's crown. That when I go to heaven, I will receive a crown for the souls that are saved because of my faithful proclamation of the gospel. Have you been a creative witness during this time? And are you prayerfully considering how you can share the gospel even today? We need perseverance that proves our belief in the resurrection. Our final point comes from the last two verses here. Pursuits that proceed from the resurrection. Paul gets a little little tough here. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Right before that, he says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Paul uses a well-known Greek idiom here to shame his opposition and even those in Corinth that are buying into the deceit. What deceit is going on? There is a deceit in the church that is denying the resurrection of the dead. It might accept the resurrection of Christ, but they're saying the rest of us aren't going to be raised. And Paul says that's a lie from hell. Don't be deceived. Some of you have been deceived, Corinthians, and it's time to stop. Because if you deny the resurrection of the dead, if you buy into the deceit, it will corrupt your morals. Paul says, dismiss deception and corrupting company. Deceit that undermines our doctrine will lead to immorality. If we don't believe in a judgment, then why would I struggle with sin? Why not just give in? The world is encouraging me every day to give in. But I strive to survive and to struggle and to walk in the Spirit because there is a resurrection of the dead. He moves on, rouse yourselves to righteousness. I love the King James, awake to righteousness, you sleeper, awake, be sober-minded and cease from sin. Going back to Isaiah, be sober-minded. What did they do in Isaiah 22? They got drunk. Paul says, don't be like those who live for the day, but be sober and awake with an eye to the future. And in so doing, this is the clearest call to repentance in this passage. Turn to righteousness and stop sinning. If you will pursue righteousness, you will cease from sin. And I'll give you one more, says Paul. You know about God. Some don't. I speak this to your shame. Walk in knowledge of God, and you will shun the shame. If you will walk in the knowledge that you have of God, if you will obey, you will receive honor. If we go back to 1 Corinthians 3, we'll see that there is a day. There is a day when the judgment comes, and if you have built on the foundation of Christ with precious and wonderful material, it will be tested by fire, and you will take it with you into glory. But if you build with straw and stubble, it will be burned by the fire, and you will suffer loss. There is a judgment, and the judgment is coming for you and I. Do we have pursuits that proceed from the resurrection? Have you bought into lies? It's really difficult. I know so many people that went to seminary and came out unchristian. They lost their faith. I think Gateway has a better track record. We believe the scripture, our faculty believe in the scripture. But there are lies, and you're going to be studying some of these lies, as you must, so that you can help your, those that you serve work through some of these things. But be careful not to fall into lies. Be careful with what you read and what you watch what you study. Who are your friends? When you hang out together, are you associating in such a way that you're bringing light in, or are you participating in darkness? Investigate your company. Renew righteous living. It is time to turn from sin. This could be the topic of every sermon. Stop sinning, right? But it is time. It's time to stop. It's time to turn from hate, from gossip, from pornea. And devote yourselves to knowing and obeying the risen Lord. Allow the truth to set you free. I wanted to close with an illustration. It's a fourth century motto. The Latin is lex orandi 
lex credendi, lex vivendi. It means the law of what is prayed is the law of what is believed is the law of what is lived. We've seen Paul show us that we need practices that point to the resurrection. What is prayed matters. How we worship matters. It points us to the resurrection of Christ. And when we have the right practices, we are undergirding the right belief. And then when we have the right belief, it is strengthened by our practices, we can persevere even in persecution and prove the resurrection in our own lives. Finally, we need pursuits that proceed from the truth of the resurrection. When our belief is right, undergirded by right practices, we have right living. Lex vivendi, what is lived. So I wanted to leave you with that today. What are they doing? They're doing something that points to the resurrection of Christ. Are we doing the same? Are we living lives of the resurrection? Let us pray, and I think we'll close. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship you this morning. Thank you for allowing us to sing praises, to come boldly before your throne for renewal, for the transformation of our minds through the hearing of your word. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Open our spiritual eyes and ears as we go forward today. Grant us the opportunity to bear witness to the living Christ and our coming resurrection. Amen. Let's stand and sing together one last verse and chorus. Sing, when Christ shall come. When Christ shall come. With shout of acclamation. And take me home. What joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in a humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great Thou art. Then sings, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee, how great Thou art, how great Thou art. Thank you so much for being here today. We will see you next week. Go in the peace of Jesus and finish your day well.